they don't want tourists to have to pay these really exorbitant values. They're hoping to make it more affordable, um, maybe not to exactly every person, but um, to whoever can afford their rates. So the first thing that we'll kind of talk about are the basic requirements for survival. Before we get into the, the health impacts that happen on the various systems, the various body systems, as well as specific hazards that are related to being um, either in space or inside of a confined chamber, like a space shuttle, um, any space vehicle, or the space station. So the first thing that that we need are are pretty much our basic requirements for survival, whether we're going on a camping trip or we're deep sea diving or all the way to space. So astronauts, they need to be either in an appropriate vehicle or a suit at all times. So they have to have support for their breathing. Um, they need access to water, um, food that that is going to um, pretty much support their, their life. Um, shelters, so they need to be in an appropriate heat condition, and um, that also goes with the breathing that, that they have an atmosphere that, that they can live in. They need their, their waste to be taken care of, and they also need um, to, to have rest and appropriate um, sleep in order to, to function well, especially in a hazardous condition such as um, operating a space vehicle. So the first things that we'll consider are the shelter and the breathable air. So here you can see a diagram of the International Space Station. Um, just as a question, who has seen the International Space Station fly by? Yeah, there is a website online where, where you can find the times when it's going to be flying by in the, the direction of the horizon. So you can watch it fly by. And, and it's usually um, pretty obvious that it's at night. So. I recommend that. No, I put some times of when it will be flying by in the next couple of days in a later slide. So the International Space Station, as we discussed, discussed was launched a couple of decades ago. And it is pretty much the ideal shelter that, that people could think of for, for astronauts in a sustainable way that takes the kind of minimum requirements of energy and, and other expenses. So the first thing that we think about for um, shelter is the air. We need oxygen. So the way that people um, on the space station, they generate oxygen is usually by electrolysis of water. So that means that the water is split into oxygen and hydrogen. And the hydrogen is vented out. And the oxygen gas is vented into the, the breathable cabin air system. So. Um, that's essentially how the astronauts are able to breathe by, by splitting air, by, by splitting water. But there are also backups that cargo ships, they bring pressurized oxygen storage tanks in order um, for any sort of emergencies. And another consideration for the, the breathing on the space station or any space vehicle is that in the microgravity atmosphere, uh, the only source of the circulation will be fans and to a lesser extent the movement of, of various objects or the people. So you can have pockets, for example, of carbon dioxide forming. And there are physiological consequences to that. So people can experience fatigue or drowsiness. They might be confused, short of breath, dizziness, and headaches. And these are not things that you want on a space mission. So. Um, that's why fans are an extremely important aspect of the, the shelter of any space vehicle. And another consideration is water. We all need water. So here you can see a picture of an astronaut with essentially the, the bubble of water that forms in microgravity. So they have water that is packed in, in contingency water containers. So they always have a, a large excess of water for what they, they need at the moment. And the, everything on the space station is aimed to be recycled as much as possible. So the, there's a water processor in the orbit that's collecting humidity from the air inside. And there's also a, a reclaiming of water system from the environmental control and life support system um, from wastewaters, which are either coming from the fuel cells of the space shuttle 
or from from urine of, of the astronauts and from other sort of sources. And, and that was a system that was developed by NASA. And food is something else that, that we like to talk about. I think many of us have tried those kind of astronaut food or astronaut ice cream things. Um, so the, the food for the first astronauts was usually kind of toothpaste-like in not in not in flavor <laughs> or anything, but in in the form. And now there are a lot of a lot wider variety of, of foods that the astronauts have access to. They can choose from any sort of foods and a lot of them are hydratable. And another interesting thing is that the salt and pepper, so because of, of the, the microgravity environment, often people will have kind of essentially a, a stuffy nose. So the same things that we experience here, so they find it harder to taste. So they they really like their salt and pepper. But you can't use the powdered salt and pepper. It could clog the air vents or equipment, get stuck in eyes, or any other sort of orifices. So we, we don't want that. So they have liquid salt and pepper for that. And there's an oven, but no fridges. So the food has to be very well um, contained. And it also has to be nutritionally balanced um, for nutrients that will be lost in, in the end of voyage. And so waste, I won't get too much into the details, but it is going to happen. <laughs> and um, essentially, the, the liquid and the solid waste, their, their collection and retention is going to be directed by the air flow. And so they have very special kind of toilets and all sorts of funnels that, yeah, you can imagine. <laughs> there, there are videos online. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last sort of basic thing that we all need is sleep. So as, as you can imagine, in a microgravity environment, you can sleep anywhere, either on the, the floor, the sides, the ceiling, anywhere where you're not in the way. And so they, the astronauts, they have access to either individual sleeping cabins, or they can attach sleeping bags anywhere. For example, you can see um, this one attached to the lab. And um, they also use rigid cushions um, in order to add pressure to their backs to kind of make it more like sleeping on Earth. And another important consideration for sleep also comes back to the carbon dioxide. In the environment of space, the carbon dioxide that the astronauts themselves are breathing out, um, because of the lack of circulation, it could form a, a bubble of carbon dioxide around their head, and um, they could kind of experience this, 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 the, um, the symptoms that I mentioned or suffocate. So they have to sleep by an air vent or, and have appropriate air circulation in their, their chamber. So, so, sorry. So there are some specific health risks that come from being in space, and the the two main ones that we'll focus on are arising from the microgravity, um, the microgravity environment, and from radiation from outside. Other risks that are kind of urgent risks are um, decompression because the, the ship is going to be pressurized to, to mimic the atmosphere and have near the local environment. But if the ship is damaged either by space debris or, or any other means, um, if, essentially if the ship is compromised, the, the air expands outwards. It, it's not going to be easy to survive if that's not um, fixed in, in some way. So um, another thing that can happen, and it's also a sort of critical failure, would be um, a fire that is not able to be contained. You have a lot of oxygen because um, you need oxygen for, for the people to breathe. And if, if the containment is not done properly and a fire forms, then, then that's also a critical failure. So um, I won't talk about those. We'll focus mostly on the microgravity and the radiation effects. So that was pretty much the introduction. And now I'll, I'll kind of show you the format that I'd like this, this talk to take, is um, we're going to act as if we're space doctors or space medicine specialists. 
and we're going to do some case studies. So how many of you are in some sort of medical profession or medical students? Anyone? Cool. So am I correct in assuming you guys look at a lot of case studies? Sometimes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, case studies, they can, they can serve as examples for, for people who will encounter students encounter similar problems in their practice. So um, what we're going to do is I'll detail some sort of medical case. Um, I'll describe the background or um, any sort of, of clues that, that someone who's encountering the patient has picked up. And then, um, and then we'll talk about kind of a decision that we want to make in a, in a situation or figure out or like what else we want to do to figure out what's happening or how to change it and how to prevent it. So that's going to be the format. It's going to be interactive at some point. So get excited. <laughs> so first I'll introduce the, the space specific um, health risks. So microgravity and radiation in short. And then we'll go into um, specific uh, hazards on the, in a space vehicle. So um, microgravity, as the prefix says, you're essentially experiencing a millionth of the gravity on Earth. And um, that's happening because the space station is, is essentially in, in free fall. So microgravity means for physiologically that, that, the, that blood isn't draining from the head as well as we're used to in our gravity here on Earth. And so you'll have an increase in pressure inside your head and in intracranial pressure. And um, for that, you can kind of imagine what happens when you stand on your head. So it's that sort of a feeling that, that can happen. And so that's going to be one factor that, that really affects the functioning of some of your system. And also some other things that will kind of contribute to hazards to living in space or, or even being in space for a short, short amount of time are that there some common physics processes aren't going to be happening. So one of those is convection. Here you see a candle burning. And the one on the top is on Earth. So you see the formation of soot, you see heat transfer. And um, on the bottom one, you see a spherical flame. And it's only going to burn when it reaches a source of oxygen. And then for the buoyancy, you can see that in Earth's atmosphere, or in Earth's gravity, the different density fluids, they'll layer. But the air in, in this image over here is in kind of bubbles in the microgravity environment. And also sedimentation, the particulates inside of, of a liquid, they'll settle out of a fluid on Earth, they'll end up on the bottom, but they will be suspended evenly in microgravity. So these are all considerations that people who are in space have to take um, for for either health purposes or how to deal with potential hazards. And then another source um, of health hazards is radiation. So there are several different sources of radiation that can occur in space. And this is kind of where it becomes really important whether you're really far in space or whether you're close. So the International Space Station is in lower Earth orbit, so it's still kind of affected by Earth's magnetic field. And that's helpful because that protects it from what's called, called galactic cosmic radiation, but it can still be affected by um, radiation from the sun, and, and proper protection has to be taken for that. And um, when you're going further out in space, the galactic cosmic radiation is um, a big concern. Um, so radiation, the health effects that it can have are, it can increase risk of cancer, as I'm sure we've all heard, um, cardiovascular disease, um, disorders of the central nervous system, as well as um, acute radiation syndrome. So um, that, that's kind of a, a poisoning picture, I guess, where, where you have um, nausea and vomiting and then fever and then your, um, your bone marrow is essentially shutting down. And then if, if the dose of the radiation is large enough to um, completely suppress the bone marrow, then that really increases the risk of death. 
the next step attack is really high. So um, essentially, radiation, um, the category of the mission, or the, the place that you're going and the duration is going to have really big implications on, on, the, on the effects of, of the radiation that is inevitably experienced in space. And for that reason, um, you can see here an astronaut that has um, dose emitters. So um, there, there are a lot of experiments ongoing and in the past that have been measuring the amount of radiation and trying to better understand um, how to expect radiation and how to better prevent with either personal equipment or, um, or changing the, the structure of the, the vehicle. So. We have our first step case study where we're going to have to make a decision. So you're, you're a space medicine specialist. You're looking at candidates for a mission to the International Space Station. And you have this perfect candidate, but um, she's pre previously undergone successful radiotherapy for cancer. And what she says is that only her occupational exposures, so exposures from work, um, should be considered when determining whether she's fit for a long duration mission because the therapeutic doses of radiation are different from the effects of space radiation. So, do you agree? Or, yeah, what specific? No. No? Does anyone want to explain further? Yeah. Um, I would personally disagree um, with the lateral mission. It's not in small part because the uh, uh, follow-up jobs were also selected for cancer when they were selected by mission. So of any family cancer or history of cancer. So there is some link between genetic predisposition for getting cancer and uh, the likelihood of getting it. So especially for the long-term mission, I mean, uh, it's just, I think, too, too much risk. Yeah, that's definitely true. So um, I think there, there is no clear answer. There is not kind of a, a clear viewpoint on this. So um, as a space medicine doctor, we can think about what additional information we might want to ask and get from the patient before we make this final decision. And um, also, if we consider, um, yeah, so the implication of, of making that decision of saying, no, you, you can't come because you had radiation from your cancer therapy, that's going to declare the astronaut unfit for um, any sort of long duration missions for the rest of her career. So are there any sort of um, kind of risk mitigation strategies that you could think about or ways to kind of lower the risk of, um, that will come from sending an astronaut with predisposition to, ra to radiation? So 
So there are some specific health risks that come up from being inside of a state vehicle because essentially you're inside a confined space that's meant to go at really fast speeds and survive being in, in space. So you're going to have a lot of different machines inside that, that can um, lead to, to toxins. Um, you'll have microbes, you're in a contained environment, so, so you're at higher risk of pretty much infecting each other. And another consideration that um, I guess sounds a little bit lame after toxins and microbes is noise, but that's also really important um, because of the noise of, of pretty much everything happening inside of your space vehicle. It can have effects, um, okay, I'll, I'll just talk about that when I get to that slide. So the, the first thing that we can think about are the different sorts of, of toxic hazards that arise inside of your space vehicle. So um, there, there are all different sorts of sources, from either varying from the materials used in, in different components of, of the vehicle, all the way to human metabolic products. So one of the important processes that is possibly the, the most dangerous is called pyrolysis. So that's when something decomposes at a high temperature. And you can have um, the formation of toxic chemicals from that. And for example, um, in the same sort of event in Earth's gravity and versus in, in the microgravity, proportionally more carbon monoxide would be formed. Um, so if you have a reaction where you have carbon um, monoxide and carbon dioxide forming, carbon monoxide is a lot more toxic. And on Earth, there will be less of the carbon monoxide, more of the carbon dioxide. On space, it's the opposite. So carbon monoxide is um, an important consideration on space, like, like it is for us on Earth to some extent as well. And um, all, of course, the hardware and materials that are going to be used in your space vehicle, they'll be tested at high temperatures to see whether they're, they're releasing too much um, toxin, too much pollution. But um, there's never a complete guarantee that everything is going to be working according to, to the original standards. So um, there are always a lot of different sensors for, for the toxic um, compounds that, that, can, that can arise. And specifically from the human metabolic products, um, we don't really think about them that much, but, but we're always producing a, a whole bunch of things. Um, obviously, the, the carbon dioxide but we also produce um, some amounts of carbon monoxide, methane, hydrogen, water vapor, and um, some of these are safe, but the, the methane, the hydrogen, and the carbon monoxide, they, they require filters for, for their removal. Well, yeah. The, the methane and the hydrogen and the water, they're not pos posing a toxicity threat, but the, the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, they must be. And another source of, um, of hazards from being inside of the space vehicle comes from, from the microbiology. So essentially, wherever you have people, you're always going to have microbial life. It's, it's just something that we have to deal with. But um, of course, the, har the harmful microorganisms, they'll be, be posing a health risk to the people. And they could also pose risks to um, hardware and equipment and any sort of scientific experiments that you're trying to, to produce. And, and in the space flight um, kind of environment, there your um, immune system is usually depleted as compared to what it would be on Earth. So the risk of infection is much, um, it can be raised, as well as the the virulence of some of these microorganisms. So kind of more recent research is finding that microorganisms, they, they act quite differently in space and in a microgravity environment than they do on Earth. So um, they have to take a lot of precautions that um, kind of molds and bacteria and viruses are um, controlled and tested for. And noise, as I mentioned, it's also a, consider a consideration you have to make when you live inside a spacecraft. Um, there's a lot of devices required inside the spacecraft to move it and to keep the people alive inside of it. 
and being able to communicate and hear each other inside of the spacecraft is, and hear each other as well as hear any sort of um, emergency alarm is going to be extremely important for safety in, in any sort of a space vehicle. And um, there will always be sources of noise. Um, for example, on the International Space Station, your life support systems, such as the fans, they'll be a source of noise as well as any sort of experimental and system equipment. And another interesting consideration is that there are a lot of metal surfaces. So you will have um, kind of reflections of the noise that can um, increase the amount of noise uh, to what that compared to what you might have expected. So that's why, as I mentioned before, there are sleep compartments. And those are supposed to be low noise areas where where the crew are able to sleep and kind of get some acoustic rest. And they're also, um, also uh, relatively often subjected to testing. So here you can see an astronaut um, doing, can you see what slide is? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Too much light. Too much light. Oh. 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 Oh.
And so you definitely need good monitors um, everywhere in your space as well. Yeah, sorry. Don't they have carbon monoxide alarms like you can have in your basement or your house? Yeah. Well, how come they didn't go off to see the carbon monoxide from the roof? So this was a hypothetical scenario. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they definitely have carbon monoxide sensors. So now we can get to the effects on the different body systems. So um, as I mentioned, there's um, the two kind of big space health risks, which are the, um, the microgravity environment and the um, radiation. So they're going to be affecting all your, all your different systems. Um, yeah. You can kind of see it. This, this is a nice chart that um, I guess you can also <laughs> look at later, which kind of details the um, responses of the different systems and the reversible and um, the reversible health effects, such as um, often the headaches, um, they will go away post flight. But there are also health risks that um, can last after the um, after your back off Earth. So without further ado, we'll just look at the system. Um, one of the first things that, that people will notice um, when they're going into a microgravity environment is that um, their face kind of seems puffy, especially their body fluids, they shifted toward the head because of the lack of gravity. And um, so in addition to the visual face puffiness that you can observe in this astronaut here, comparing, I don't know if you can see it, <laughs> the astronaut here on Earth versus um, the, the astronaut in space, um, there's a, a facial puckiness that's visible. So in addition to that, um, people experience nasal congestion and headaches. And so this will also lead to effects in different systems of the body, including vision and um, your cardiovascular system. So for vision, um, in this picture that you probably can't see, there's um, an astronaut checking another astronaut's um, eye pressure with the air pump thing that, that the optometrist uses on all of them. Um, so um, one of the aspects of eye health is that because of the, the uh, microgravity um, environment, the eyes, they can't clean themselves as well. So often um, they'll need to use eye drops. And also um, there's this, uh, health phenomenon that is not super well understood. It's called um, the IIP syndrome, visual impairment and intracranial pressure syndrome. So many astronauts, they, they find that they experience poor vision after their flight, even for years after, and they look for all sorts of causes. It's not completely certain, but um, people um, find from scans that the pressure changes in the brain and the spinal fluid caused by the weightlessness in the microgravity might be partially to blame. But um, only some of the astronauts experience these symptoms, not everyone, and um, kind of new or better imaging techniques will be needed to understand this better. And so um, another system that's gonna be affected is the cardiopulmonary system. So your heart and your lungs. Um, on Earth, you have the downward pull of gravity. Uh, okay, you can kind of see this diagram. And um, your, your body supplying blood to your lower limbs. And then um, the second person, the one kind of like floating up, is um, early on orbit. You have your blood volume shifting toward your chest and your head. And you have more blood than usual in the upper portion of your body. Um, as, as we, we um, kind of see. And um, in the, the third person, um, you see that they're having some sort of adaptation. So the, the body, it actually reduces the amount of fluid in the system and the heart becomes smaller. And then when astronauts, they come back to Earth, then the blood goes back down to their legs. And since they have less um, blood than, than they did originally, there isn't enough to kind of fill up the whole system, and that causes orthostatic hypotension. So who here has experienced orthostatic hypotension? So that's essentially when you get up after you've been sitting a long time and you feel dizzy. So how many of us have felt that? <laughs> yeah, so astronauts 
allowed to feel that too when they come back there. So we have a case study. We have an astronaut um, who's in his fourth month on the ISS. And now he finds that he needs glasses. He's using some fancy glasses on, um, on board. And he finds that he has to move his head to see all the objects in his field of vision, and he's having headaches. What's going on? Yeah, exactly. DIIP. So he's one of the actually 80% of men who develop this syndrome during their space flight. And um, so, what? Okay. I don't think we discussed what to do, so I'll just say what we should do. Um, we should um, keep track of him frequently. We should um, lower his salt intake to decrease his blood pressure because. Um, some of the symptoms of this syndrome are um, going to be made worse by hypertension, so high blood pressure. And there should also um, be care taken that he's not in an area with the carbon dioxide buildup because that will increase the symptoms <coughs> as well. And also, this has actually happened um, several times um, on the International Space Station the flight surgeons, so the, the doctor in charge essentially, they can ask that the CO2 level is lowered um, for the space station, and um, this has really helped essentially the, the health problems for some span of time. Um, yeah, so that's something they can do. They can lower the, the CO2 amount, even though that will take some more um, energy. Because on the ISS, you have about 10 times the amount of CO2 than, than we experience on Earth all the time because um, the, the scrubbing process or the process of which you're removing CO2 from the air around you, it, it, um, it takes energy. And then another system um, that's going to be affected by the weightlessness is the musculoskeletal system. So on Earth, your usual bone loss of aging is maybe 1% per year. Um, and that's compared to one to two percent on the um, on the ISS or in some sort of microgravity situation. So that's why you always hear about astronauts having to um, perform high impact exercise for several hours a day. Um, it's because in microgravity, your muscles they don't have to work against the force of gravity as they usually do on Earth. And because of these anti gravity muscles, they're unloaded then you have a decrease in your muscle mass and strength. So um, it's the same thing that happens here. If you don't use it, then, then you lose it. So um, on, on the space station or any sort of microgravity environment, that's even more important. Um, so you need water. Um, we can do another case study. So in a space flight one year ago, uh, a crew member, they had bone loss of 10% from a uh, part of their hip. And this crew member is being considered for another mission to ISS in, in one year. So what should we consider with the crew member's bone health state? And what possible therapies could be used before the flight to correct um, any sort of, of bone health diminishment that happened before? <laughs> you need to check to see if you regain any of that bone mass from being on Earth after the leave, after you leave the flight. Yeah, that's a really good idea. So, um, what the physician will usually order is to look at the bone density and um, to compare the bone density against people of, of similar um, demographic. And because there's some limited data and it shows that people will experience similar kind of um, reactions to microgravity in terms of the bone density on another space flight mission, then um, it's important to do kind of, um, to fix any problems that might still exist. So in addition to increasing exercise um, in the one year prior to the next launch, there's also um, some drug therapies that people use um, that can be considered for this condition. So another um, aspect that happens in space is 
is actually something that affects um, about 70% um, or more of the astronauts that fly for the first time. It's called space motion sickness, and it's not fun, <laughs> essentially. Um, and from the susceptibility to the space motion sickness, you can't predict it by the susceptibility to ground motion sickness. So that makes it um, kind of even more complicated to predict who is going to have the sort of symptom. And it usually happens um, within the first 24 hours and resolves um, in about day two or three um, as, the, as the person adapts better to, to the environment. Um, so it's the same kind of symptoms you can imagine for motion sickness. So you have um, your nausea, your vomiting, your loss of appetite. And this is also an important consideration for um, commercial space flight as we have kind of a more varied um, group of people wanting to go to space because um, we have people who are reliant on certain medications and in the conditions of space motion sickness, it may be hard to keep any sort of, of medication down. And there can also be increased dehydration. So um, that, that's an important consideration I would say also. And, um, I won't go too long with this, but um, there is also clearly, um, you can imagine that there are some psychological and behavioral adaptations that need to be made. Um, if you're going to space, you're going to a very different environment than you were before. Um, and you're also in a very group, small group of people, so you have um, some feelings of isolation, separation, and um, you have to work cohesively with your group. So. Um, there are, also, there are often um, also cultural and language differences between the people that go up because it is um, an international endeavor. So that can also be um, a, a stressor. And the kind of um, other important one is that the environment itself. So effects from the oxygen levels or the carbon dioxide levels, the noise, the exposure to light, they can all affect um, the mood, any, um, effects on cognitive ability are also kind of um, not, not out of line. So um, the, the astronauts, they will be susceptible to a lot of, of the psychological kind of issues that we can, we can have on Earth as well. And, and they have to be treated in ways that will work in the space flight environment. So we can do another case study. Um, we have a mission specialist who's part of a three-person crew to the ISS with two colleagues. Um, so we can assume mission specialist Elliot is from, let's say, Canada, and then along with his two Russian colleagues. Um, so three weeks into an otherwise nominal or like everything's gone really well mission, the Russian commander wants to speak with the, the flight doctor and says that this um, specialist has become more withdrawn, isn't participating in the, the dinners with the crew, isn't interacting with his crew, and he's taking longer to perform tasks, and he's kind of more um, short or irritable when he's talking to the mission control. So what might be going on? What other data do we want to look at? And any environmental factors we might want to assess. So this is the Russian mission Environment as um, 
kind of easy to live in as possible and um, make sure that their exercise time is preserved because that, that can release good endorphins, make them feel better, control the CO2 levels so, so they're not feeling ill, um, and kind of bring them into the group. So yeah, that um, mental health is a big consideration in these safe missions as well. And then one last case study. We have a mission specialist. Um, she says she feels her mind is fuzzy or in a fog. She can't um, concentrate well. When she was receiving extra oxygen before a spacewalk, um, she felt better. She saw that colors were brighter. She felt more alert on the oxygen. Um, so she has headaches in the morning. They're usually relieved by ibuprofen. And um, another important thing is she's the only crew member that's reporting these, these symptoms. And she um, seems to be as social as usual um, and is sleeping normally. So what are your concerns of her well-being and um, yeah, what environmental factors? Some sort of maybe anxiety, a little bit of anxiety from being confined to concrete. Yeah, that could definitely be a factor. Sort of restlessness, like lack of sleep and uh, tiredness. Yeah, it seems that she's getting a, a good amount of sleep and is, is remaining somewhat social, but that's a possibility. Allergic reaction? Allergic reaction to what? Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, possibly she could be having some allergic reaction affecting her. Available to, to pretty much everyone who can pay for it. 
um, is, yeah, so commercial space companies, they um, include, um, they're pretty much all run by, by billionaires, by really rich people. So you have companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, and they're all kind of promising space flight for, for the masses. Um, but that means that the passengers will be less standard, and the consequences of the travel of, of these passengers would be less predictable. Um, for example, if you think about the requirements for a CSA astronaut, um, there are very specific requirements, and um, they undergo extensive training before their, their flight. So, um, so it can be imagined that there should be some sort of a screening process and um, some sort of training beforehand as well for a commercial space flight passenger. Um, yeah, and I'm over time. So we can discuss this further in the question section. I will just um, wrap up. So here is how you can see the International Space Station itself and wave hello to all the astronauts up there. Um, you can go to spotthestation.nasa.gov and put your um, the place you live, and it will show you when exactly it's coming by. So, so tonight it's coming by at 9.38. Um, maybe keep an eye out, ask, ask someone if they can point you in the right direction. And um, yeah, if you want to learn more about um, space health, um, astronaut health, space medicine, then um, these are some, some good resources. You'll have access to these slides, so, so you can find them yourself later. But um, there are some good um, books out there, as well as the, the um, government space agency websites are a good and reliable source um, for, for information about astronaut health or any other aspect of space. And um, how to get involved with kind of the space community um, around here, Astro Miguel is great. They have their Astro on Tap event coming up very soon. Um, and other um, kind of groups around the Miguel community that, that work with space are um, the Miguel Rocket Team, the Miguel Space Systems Group, so you can ch check out their websites as well. If you're a student, you can get involved with them. They also do outreach events and stuff like that, so yeah. Thank you.
more That seems to work relatively, relatively well. I, I think there are a lot of active mechanisms going on in that that are kind of helping things go down via like, like cilia and your digestive system helping the, the food go down. So I think that, that tends to function. Does that make sense?